Hello, in this episode, we are going to discuss about variational autoencoder. So first with the autoencoder that we have used. Um, so it takes an original input and has an encoder and then goes through a latent space like a bottleneck here and reconstruct the image through a decoder. Okay? And if you look at it carefully, is that, well, um, the encoder, what it does is that when you go to a bottleneck here, let's say it has like one, two, three, four, five, six dimensions. Um, well, here's an origin image, it goes to encoder, rather than ca carrying all these like 784 pixels, it will uh, summarize it into a latent dimension, which uh, maybe let's say smile 90%, skin tone 85%, gender 92%, beard 5%, glasses 1%, hair color 72%, something like in an abstraction, what this um, image is. Um, we don't know what they are, but suppose they are like this. And then it goes to a decoder and blow up that image again. So that's what an autoencoder does. However, there are some limitations of autoencoders in the sense that, for example, smile. So let's say this picture is a smile of, let's say, 0 0.6 minus 0 0.6. Um, but is it? Um, let's say there are gradations of it. And, and this seems to be like what an autoencoder does is that it's like a discrete value. It's like a Mona Lisa. I'm not sure whether it's smiling or not. Then he has a little bit closer to smiling and he has a smile. Okay, so there are some kind of values um, that autoencoder associates. But maybe it's not just that, um, that um, how, what percent it is a smiling, but also how certain are we? This looks like a smiling picture and um, the uncertainty around it is small. The Mona Lisa picture is that like at zero, but it's not that it's really zero, but it's like, it's not quite clear. So though it's, it has a very wide variation. So can we have something like this rather than just a fixed point of probability of the latent space? Can we have like a um, gradation of it, like a probability distribution of it? And that's where the autoencoder comes in. The autoencoder, what it does is that it takes an origin image and goes into the encoder. And through the encoder, what it gives is that it gives a distribution. Okay, of the latent variables. And out of that, what the decoder does is that, well, it just draws like according to this probability distribution of value. And each time you train, it will take a different value, but more likely from this um, peak here. Uh, so it takes a value and goes into decoder and then reconstruct the image. And then this is like taking into account, not just a, um, like a point value, like autoencoder, what it will do is that it's like it's directly encoding a latent value here. A variation on encoder is that the encoder will just give a mean and standard deviation, or <clears throat> and then it has a cloud here, and the decoder will pick a value from this cloud. So it's a probability distribution that it does. Technically, in an algorithm, what we did in the autoencoder was that you have an input and an encoder that goes to a latent space, like the bottleneck, and then a decoder and output. What the variational autoencoder does is that it has an input encoder. The encoder actually gives out not the latent space directly, but gives a mean and standard deviation of a normal distribution. And from there, um, you randomly sample a number to get a latent space value, which you send to decoder and output. So this is what a variational autoencoder does. There are some technicalities, uh, if you're interested, uh, that in the original idea that what it is, is that in the bottleneck, at the bottleneck stage here, there's uh, some parameters like mean and standard deviation and the input values coming out to get a latent space value. Okay, like from a distribution here, pick a Z and all that. This is actually difficult to back propagate because you cannot really back propagate from here, a point that it drew um, back to a distribution. So what people do is that the trick is that well, have a random normal distribution. We know how we look like, and, um, and uh, we don't need to really model it. We know how a standard normal distribution looks like. So what we're back propagating is that we have a Z here, and the Z goes back to the X and Phi here like this. How do we do this? Well, if you have a random normal distribution, we can just have a value of mu and sigma and multiply the sigma by this random normal distribution and add the mean of it and get the Z. And this is how you can back propagate. It's called reparameterization trick. Um, has been developed by Kingman Dwelling. Um, okay. So this is one technicality that in the code will look strange. 
Um, but that's because back propagation is not possible for much sample distribution sampling. So we have to separate the random um, noise part apart from this um, um, parameter of the probability distribution. Another thing that's um, needed is that a variational approximation. What we do here is that when we do here a uh, sampling, here the sampling here, is that um, in essence, um, we are trying to um, get an approximation. See the latent space, the true distribution may look like here, not even a single hump, but maybe a double hump or maybe complicated space or whatever. We are trying to find a normal distribution curve in the latent space for each of this distribution. Remember this distribution? We are forcing it to be a normal distribution that is as close as possible to the true latent space distribution, which we don't know how it looks like, but we want to measure how different they are. And a way to measure it is what we call kuhlberg leibler loss, okay? Uh, which basically the idea is that um, change the shape of the normal distribution curve to get it as close as possible here, isn't it? So if you have a data set here, here you have an X space, you go through an encoder, this Q, okay? Which we actually form, fix the form to be a bell shape. And then here you have a Z space, okay? And then you go through a decoder and reconstruct it. Um, the question is, how do you get that? And, and here you need this uh, kuhlberg leibler distribution. At the end of the day, um, there's a formula for that that comes out um, that we'll be using in our program. Okay? So let's see how the program looks like. So the fraud detection, um, it's the next step, but here looks how a variational autoencoder looks like. And we are going to use uh, the MNIST data that uh, we had. So pretty much the same thing. Um, and the uh, NumPy and Panda and the TensorFlow Keras functions we need to create a neural network. And then, so the beginning part is the same as before. So let's just um, go quickly pass by. So loading the library, load the data um, directly from Keras provided MNIST and we scale it. Um, so here is the new part, okay? So we have a, a original dimension 784. We're gonna shrink it down to two dimension. We have one intermediate dimension, 256, okay? And set the environment parameters. Here's a function that samples the random number. Remember, we have to sample, get a distribution and sample it, okay? So what we do here is that um, we take the mean and standard deviation of a normal distribution. And then um, here is um, basically how to sample from a random normal distribution um, and then multiply the standard deviation and add the mean later on onto this epsilon, which is a standard normal deviation number. So we do pick a number from there, okay? The encoder is similar as the autoencoder, except that you have an input and then the middle layer, and then it goes to the uh, dense node of mean. Okay, so to here, the first dense layer from X to H, the H sends once to mean and once to log of variance. And then from that distribution, you pick a random number latent space Z. So the encoder, what it will take is input X, and it will give out the Z mean, Z log variance, and Z, we call that as output. So output comes in three numbers, basically. So that's the difference between autoencoder and variational autoencoder. The decoder looks pretty much the same as the autoencoder. It has a latent space, comes a number, intermediate dimension, and then to blow out to the original dimension. So that's our decoder. So the variational autoencoder is that it takes an X, goes through an encoder and then a decoder. And we want the encoder um, um, number of the two, which is the Z that we want to give it. Remember the encoder gives the mean, the variance and Z. So zero, one, two. We are going to give the decoder number two, the Z, okay, to recreate and call it VAE model. So here's just the VAE loss. The loss, again, um, we had to take care of the kuhlberg leibler loss in addition to the reconstruction loss. So here is the cross-entropy, binary cross-entropy loss. 
but also we are adding that Kullberg libel loss. Remember, we had something like this here. So we are adding that part in this form. So it's a customized uh, loss function, basically. And okay, so it's a bit of an advanced technique in neural network. So let's compile the and then train it. Okay. So it's gonna take a while. Let's come back when it's being trained. Okay, it's done training. So let's see how the encoder output looks like from next test. And again, the two for uh, the Z variable here. So in a plot, it looks like this here. So you can see the similar digits, same digits cluster in a similar place here. How about the reconstruction data? So the VAE output and compare the mean square error here. Uh, let's select an image how it well performed. Let's say the first one, which is a seven. And um, the reshape image. So the image, the original image is here and the reconstructed image is here. So again, not quite as good as the original one, but it does a decent job. So this is how you construct a VAE and we demonstrated using MNIST data. Thank you for watching this episode.